Boom. Okay. So I figured we could begin uh, just with review, and then we'll dive into the rest of uh, the passage. And so we began yesterday by considering three uh, characteristics of creation's witness, right? And, uh, you know, we would be wise to take heed to their example as New Testament believers. And we learned that their witness is loud. We learned that their witness is continuous. And we learned that their witness is universal, right? Uh, this, this declaration of God's glory, uh, day unto day, night unto night, uh, and, and there's no language where their song is not heard. And so this ought to challenge us. All of creation speaks loudly. All of creation speaks continuously. All of creation speaks universally. And so the question on the floor is, do you, right? We, we serve a God that's glorious. Are you declaring his glory? Do, do the people that you work with, do the people uh, that, that, that you consider to be friends, do your family, do they know, uh, because of your witness, the glory of your God? Do they? Are you declaring his glory? In verse 7, we see David shift his focus from uh, the glory of creation to the glory revealed in God's word, right? And I didn't make note of this yesterday, but I think it's worth mentioning that along with this transition from creation to, to scripture, the, the psalmist, he, he also acknowledges God as God initially, and as we transition into to, 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 to scripture, he starts acknowledging God as Lord, and so, so God, that, that Hebrew word is El. That means that the mighty, the powerful one. This is just a, a general name for God. But Lord, capital L-O-R-D, that's Jehovah. That's, that's Yahweh. This is the, the supreme name for God. This is the God of the covenant. And so verses 7 through 9, they list out six different names uh, for, for scripture. right? And in every instance, very clearly it says, of the Lord. Right? The, the statutes of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, which stresses the authorship and the authority by which we should receive these words. It also speaks to the personal nature of our God, to the personal nature of our God. He's not distant, y'all. In Deuteronomy, it says that the word is very nigh unto us. Right? It's very nigh unto us. And so yesterday, yesterday we saw that the, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And this speaks to uh, the comprehensive nature of the scriptures uh, and its ability to completely transform and refresh your inner person. And so like Tom was saying yesterday, this is the me medicine cabinet, right? This is the, the place where no matter what your ailment is, God's word has the remedy. And next, we saw the testimony of the Lord. And we saw that the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And this speaks to the reliable nature of Scripture and its ability to, to grow you in practical living. Mm -hmm. And so this is what Rich was saying with, with maps, right? It's reliable, the, the manuscript evidence, the, the archaeology, the, the prophecy, the, the science. This is a tested and a proven word that's reliable. And it has the power to make you wise beyond your years and beyond your experience. And lastly, yesterday, we saw the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. This speaks to them presenting the straight way, and that in following this way, it's actually the only way to find true joy. Do you know that? This is the only way to find true joy. I think of those disciples uh, on the road to Emmaus in, in Luke chapter 24 whose hearts burned within them while they were walking with Jesus, right? Man, that's what yeah. we get when we walk with Jesus. Right. That, that, yeah. So, uh, guys, the, the, the Word of God is proving its sufficiency. As we're walking through Psalm 19, look at this. It's proving its sufficiency. I, I take that back. It, it, it's Sufficient means that it's enough, mm. right? And so it's actually not proving that it's just enough. It's proving it's abundant. It's proving that it's right. more than enough. Right. Not just sufficient, it's above and beyond anything that, that we could even ask for. And so let's pray, and then we're going to dive back into the text. Mm. Um, Lord, I, I do thank you for the time uh, just to be here. Um, I thank you for your word. It's been challenging to me this weekend, Lord. Uh, it, it's beautiful, and it's sufficient, it's enough, and it's abundance. But it's way more than enough, Lord, as we consider uh, just the characteristics of your word. 
And so we just pray that you would teach us, um, and uh, man, that this word, uh, we'd receive it, man, as it is, it's just your word, it's truth. And so Lord, allow it to transform our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, you guys got Psalm 19? Yep. Does somebody want to read it out loud? We're going to read verses 7 through 14. All right, let's hear it. Yeah. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, than the honeycomb. Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Yes. Let him not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart and acceptable in, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. And so as we pick it back up in, in verse 8, we learn that the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And these commandments, they are divine decrees. Right? These are authoritative. They, they are imperious. These are coming straight from the top. And, and this passage says that they are pure. And, and what does pure mean? Initially, I, I read this and I thought that it means spotless, right? without blemish. But the very next verse, we see a word called clean, and that means spotless and without blemish. And so what does pure mean? Well, if water is pure, it means that you can look through it clearly. And so pure, it actually means, rather than being clean and spotless without blemish, that, that it's clear, it's easily understood, right? And so this, uh, again, isn't talking about something being untainted, although God's word is untainted, uh, but rather it says that God's commandments are clear, they're easily understood, that they're, they're bright as the sun. And some people believe that you can't truly grasp the meaning of Scripture. Uh, have you ever felt like that? Or do you know people that, that think, man, it's just up for, for personal interpretation, mm -hmm. you know? Some people believe that, that, that you can't actually grasp the meaning of Scripture, but the Bible says that it's pure and it's clearly seen. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this leads to the enlightening of the eyes, the illuminating of dark and, and renewing the faint. And so I think about the, the map that, that got me and Jake down here this weekend, right? We're going through all these windy roads, uh, and, and the map had a detour. Instead of taking, you know, the, the highway, it took us off into these back country roads. And it was like, you go for a mile, and then you turn right, and then you go for a mile and a half and turn left. Like, it was crazy. Um, and, you know... Whenever it commanded, whenever it gave this divine decree to us to, to turn right on Smith Mountain Road, it didn't leave us questioning whether right actually means right, you know? Uh, whenever the Bible says right, does it actually mean left? No, it's clear, right? It, it's easy to understand. Whenever it said Smith Mountain Road, it wasn't actually just some symbolic meaning, uh, you know, drive until you get to, to the Granny Smith apple tree and then make it right. That's not what it meant, right? It, it, it meant exactly what it said. It's just a ridiculous idea. And the Word of God, it's pure, it's easily understood. Whenever it says flee fornication, guess what it means? <laughs> flee fornication. There's no room for personal interpretation there. There's no room for personal interpretation. If we would receive these divine decrees in their plainness, it leads to the enlightening of the eyes, which means to, to give light. And the first mention of this word is actually in the book of Genesis chapter 1. Whenever God puts the, these great lights in, in the sky, right, to, to rule the night and to, to rule the day, and it says that he put them there to give light upon the earth, to give light upon the earth. And that's the same exact Hebrew word that enlightens the eyes. Whoa. And so this phrase, give light upon the earth, it's the same exact word, and it allows us to see things as they are. Right? It allows us to see things as they are. Which is why Psalm 119, 105 says that thy word is a, 
a lamp unto my feet, right. right? And a light unto my path. And so proof number four for the sufficiency of scripture is that the word of God is clear in its teaching and enlightens the eyes. It's clear in its teaching. It's simple to understand. In Mark chapter 10, I told you guys we've been saved through the book of Mark, right? And man, Michael brought us an awesome devotion, an awesome word from Mark chapter 10. And by the end of it, he brought us to this guy named Bartimaeus. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And Bartimaeus, uh, he was blind. And in verse 47, it says, When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus is coming, he began to cry out and to say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that, that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And, and they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garments, right? Mm -hmm. I can just picture it now. He, he rose and came to Jesus, and Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should, uh, that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. And so, again, Michael walked us through this a few days ago. But this blind man, Bartimaeus, he's crying to, to the son of David because he was blind, right? And Jesus spoke, and, and what happened? Sight. He could see. Yeah. He, he got his sight, right? And having his eyes enlightened, what did he do? Follow Jesus in the way. Um, you know, how did God guide the children of uh, Israel in the wilderness? In Exodus chapter 13, it was by a pillar of fire by night. And why did he do this? The text says, to give them light to go day and night. Mm -hmm. And to give them light, again, that's the same Hebrew word as enlighten the eyes. Right? So they could see where they're going. It wasn't a mystery, you know? He, he wanted to, to, to light their path. If you turn with me to 1 Samuel 14, we see the testimony of Jonathan. Now, this is uh, Saul's son. And he's an awesome warrior, and he's a friend of David. And in this particular section, uh, they are fighting the Philistines. And Saul, he's this pick, this kind of perfect type of antichrist in our Bible, right? He, he's a, a type of antichrist. And, and he's ordering his men into battle, and he's saying, hey, you're not allowed to eat, right? Because he wants them to get to work. And so in verse 22, it says, Likewise, all men of Israel, which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed over unto Beth Haven. And the men of Israel were distressed, distressed that day. Why are they distressed? For, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. But Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. Wherefore, he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it and then honeycomb. Mmm. Mmm. And a honeycomb. And he put his hand in his mouth, and his eyes were enlightened, is what the Bible says. Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Right? The people were distressed. And we see the people were faint. Then said Jonathan, My father hath troubled the land. See, I pray thee how mine eyes have been enlightened. I can see things as they are now, right? Because I tasted a little of this honey. As we continue to study the Bible, what we see honey constantly compared to the word of God. Yeah. How much more if happily the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found uh, for, uh, their, uh, for there not had been... Uh, much great slaughter of the Philistines. If you guys would just have had eaten, if you had sustenance, you would have slaughtered the Philistines that, that much more, right? And they smote the Philistines that day uh, from Michmash to, to Agilon, and the people were very faint. The people were very faint. In verse 32, we see the result of all this, of them 
withholding food from the people. Whenever they did eat, it says, they flew upon the spoil. They took the sheep, the oxen, the calves, and slew them on the ground, and the people did eat them with the blood, which is a transgression of the law. It led them into sin, right? And so we see this example of Jonathan, who again, uh, you know, his father Saul happens to be this type of antichrist. He consumes this honey that, we, that he finds on the ground, and we find repeatedly throughout Scripture that honey is compared with God's word. And, and you see, you know, these people, that they're fighting the Philistines all day long. In verse 24, they're distressed. In verse 31, they're faint. But in consuming the honey, Jonathan's eyes are enlightened, and he's able to see things as they are. He saw that, uh, you know, restraining the people from food was, was a bad thing. And that, that it hindered them from slaying the Philistines. And ultimately, this led them into sin. That the people were desperately hungry. Uh, that, that when they finally consumed the animal, they consumed it with the blood. But Jonathan ate the honey. He ate this sweet word of God, mm -hmm. which illuminated his eyes. Mm -hmm. And so, man, we need to be consuming. We need to be eating yes. the honey of the word. Yes. Yes. So next, we find the fear of the Lord is clean, mm -hmm. and it endures forever. And I'm not going to lie, this one caught me off guard. The fear of the Lord. Like, that doesn't sound mm -hmm. like something I want in my life, right? Mm -hmm. Fear? Oh, no. Um, but the fear of the Lord, it's a very healthy thing to have in your life. It's a very healthy thing to have in your life. The first time that this word shows up is in the book of Genesis chapter 20, when Abraham is trying to, to pass his wife off as his sister. This is such a weird passage. Um, and so why would Abraham tell everybody that his wife is his sister? He says, you know, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. So they're traveling through this land, and he says, man, the fear of God is not here. My, my wife is so hot <laughs> that these people, they're going to kill me just to try and get to her. And so, you know, we've got lots of problems here, but, you know, um, uh, you know, one of the bigger problems that Abraham's not willing to lay down his life for his wife, right? He's not willing to be Christ-like in that which is a story for another time. But through this example, we, we see that the fear of the Lord doesn't exist where sin abounds, right? The fear of the Lord, it doesn't exist where, where, where fear abounds. And so we see that the next mention occur in Exodus chapter 20, verse 20. And it says, for, for God has come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. That you sin not. And so the fear of the Lord uh, you know, uh, where it doesn't exist, sin abounds. And so the fear of the Lord is a reverence and an understanding of his righteousness that protects personal holiness. It's an understanding, it's a reverence of God's righteousness, and it protects personal holiness. The fear of the Lord is to be aware that our God, he's omnipresent. He, he is everywhere, and he's a righteous judge. And, and herein we, we find wisdom which is why Psalm 111.10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? And in Proverbs 15.33, it says, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. In Proverbs 1, verse 7, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In Proverbs 10.27, it says that the fear of the Lord, it prolongeth days. In Proverbs 14.26, it says, the fear of the Lord it, it is a strong confidence. And verse 27, it says, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. And, you know, there are many more times that this phrase shows up. But, but rather than exhausting every mention, I want to make sure that we understand that the fear of the Lord shouldn't be written off as just a feeling. Right? The, the fear of the Lord isn't just a feeling. The fear of the Lord is a truth. Right? We're talking about names for Scripture. We're talking about the, the Word of God. The fear of the Lord isn't just some feeling. It's a truth. It can be taught and it can be understood. Which is right, Deuteronomy 4, verses 9 through 10, it says, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and thus they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. So, so teach these to your sons and to your grandchildren, especially the day that thou stoodest before the, God, thy, uh, the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together and I will make them hear my words. I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth. 
and that they may teach their children, right? So the, the fear of God, it's not written off of some feeling. This is a truth. This is something that, that can be taught. This is something that can be understood. And so proof number five for the sufficiency of Scripture, the Word of God is without error, and it will last forever. And whenever I say it will last forever, I mean both in relevance, but also in existence, right? The, the Word of God, it's not going anywhere. This Word has been preserved perfectly for us, right? In Matthew 5, verse 18, it says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or, or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Right? If our word is likened unto a sword, the fact that it's clean, without spot or corruption, it means that it's never going to rust. Right? And without rust, without tarnish, it's, that means this sword, it's never going to fade away. It's in our hands forever. In Psalm 1, uh, 100, verse 5, it says that the, the Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth into how many generations? All. To all generations, mm. right? And, and here we're comforted in this. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16, it says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Right? This is a comfort. His word is eternal, both in relevance and in existence. Next, we see that the, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And this means that the, the judicial decisions and, and sentences of Jehovah are true. It means that they're, they're never false, that they're absolute. In a world of relativity, God's word, it, it's never changing. It's always true. And so proof number six for the sufficiency of scripture is that the word of God is truth. It's not just true, it, it is truth. And it's absolute authority. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's righteous altogether. The, the cool thing about the Word of God is that it's propped up by itself. You know, one section of the Bible supports another section of the Bible. One truth in the Word of God supports another truth in the Word of God. Which is why we can look to, to prophecy. It's why we can look to history and we can see that, that it's propping itself up because it's righteous altogether. The mutual parts explain and define one another. Right? I don't need to go to, to Oxford Dictionary to, to figure out what, what this word means because the, the Bible tells us what, what this word means. You know, Whenever I get to, to, to worship, I don't need to, to, to see what you know, the dictionary says worship means. I can go to, to Genesis chapter 22 mm -hmm. and see Abraham sacrificing the most precious thing that he has, his son. Mm -hmm. All the promises of God, and he's laying it down on the altar and giving it back to him. Oh, man. Worship, it requires sacrifice. It's giving everything to God, not just your voice, everything. You know? We don't have to, to, to go to the world to, to, to find these definitions. It, it's, it's absolute, and it's authority, and it's righteous altogether, you know? The, the mutual parts explain and defend itself. And so, to, to review, the commandments of the Lord, they're pure, they're enlightening the eyes, and this speaks to to, to being comprehensible, We can understand it. The, it speaks to the comprehensible nature of Scripture and its ability to illuminate areas that otherwise would be dark. Next, we see that the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And this speaks to the inerrant nature of Scripture and its eternal presence and relevance. And then we saw the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And again, these passages prove Scripture's sufficiency. But, but David, he's got a, a few more cherries to, to go on top, right? He's saying that, hey, yeah, the, the Word of God is sufficient, but it doesn't end there. It, it, it's abundant. And so in the next few verses, we find their value. And, and we're going to clue into to three keys to understanding Scripture's value. And so in Psalm 19, verse 10 through 11, it says, that they are more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. And so first we find that it's more to be desired than gold, than much fine gold. And this means that the scriptures are the greatest treasure, period. Your scriptures, they're, they're the greatest treasure, period. 
So the, the value number one. In the scriptures we find the greatest treasure. And y'all, you know, it says that the word is more precious, it's more valuable, it's to be treasured. Do you treasure, do you value the word of God? Like, like Tom was saying, I work in luxury jewelry. And it's absurd what people will spend money on, what, what people find, find value in. Right now in my store, I've got this ring that's worth $800,000 to wear on your finger. <laughs> it's crazy. It's absurd. And at the end of the day, it's going to burn. <laughs> you know? Yeah. At the end of the day, it's going to burn. Isaiah, you're, you're into investing, right? He, he was showing us uh, kind of how he does his thing. It's really, really impressive, you know, the, the return on his investments that he's getting. But did you know that if you invest in the Word of God, it's the greatest investment that you could ever make? That's true. Right? Because it's 100% return guaranteed. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes, it's the best kind of investment. <laughs> And it's an eternal investment. Yeah. You know, we, we talk about investing in these things that are of eternal value. There's only two things that are going to last forever. It's the souls of men and the word of God. All right. And so the wise man is going to invest the one into the other. Yeah. In Psalm 119, it say, uh, says, verse 72, that the law of my mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Mm. And y'all, thousands of gold and silver is a lot of gold and silver. Yeah. Uh, that's very precious. In Psalm 119, verse 127, it says, Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Mm. Y'all, gold is pretty good, but fine gold? That's even better. <laughs> and God's word is better than fine gold. Next, we find that his word is the greatest pleasure. Right? In the scriptures, we find the greatest pleasure. Uh, there is abiding pleasure in the law to those that, that seek it. Honey is good, right? J just like gold is good. But, but the, the droppings of a honeycomb, man, that, that's the sweet part, right? But, but the word of God is sweeter still. Where does your pleasure come from? Where does your pleasure come from? We can find it in the word of God. And, and last, we see that it's the greatest protector. You know, the word of God, it will not only encourage you, but, but it will warn and it will restrain you. The warn and it will restrain you, right? <clears throat> Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Yeah, so it, it opens doors, but it also closes doors. And we, we find, again, this example of Jesus and the devil. How did he withstand the wiles of the devil? It is written. It is written. It is written, right? Okay, the, the last section is going to be verses 12 through 14. 12 through 14 says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, and my Redeemer. And, and so what is the result of creation's witness? Uh, what is the result of the, the majesty of God's word revealed in our lives? Well, according to David, it's humility, right? It, it highlights our inadequacies. It highlights our, our shortcomings. It, it leaves no other response other than, than lowing ourselves before an almighty and a righteous God. David confesses, who can understand his error? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. And in this, David is acknowledging and confessing his sin. And so in applying the word of God, right, we see it's sufficient for all these things, but what happens when we apply it to our life? The first application of God's word is that scripture reveals sin in your life. Hallelujah, right? You're like, no, I don't like it when it does that. It's good. It reveals sin in your life. He says, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright. I, I shall be innocent from the transgression. He, he understands that his faults uh, are horrible, and he's desperate that God would intervene. Here, we see David acknowledge that, that he can't serve sin. 
right? He doesn't want to, to, for sin to have dominion over him, right? And so he deals with sin by submitting himself to the Father. He deals with his sin by submitting himself to his Father, <coughs> finding grace and righteousness at the hands of his Lord and Redeemer, right? And, and so the second application for Scripture, you know, is that it deals with sin. It reveals sin, but man, it, it also deals with it. In, in verse 14, he he asks uh, that the words of his mouth and the meditation of his heart would be acceptable. Mm. Right? Man, make these acceptable to me, the Lord. And so we see that David is desperate now that his mouth and his heart would just like creation, would, would, would just like scripture, bring glory to God. Whoa, it started out there, now it's getting right here. But what word should he speak? You know, what, what should the meditation of his heart be in order that it might be acceptable unto the Lord? In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy ways prosperous, then thou shalt have good success. The answer is God's word. God, guys, ultimately... You know, the, the application of God's word, the, the desire is that it would get in you. You know, if the word is in you, it's going to reveal sin. If the word is in you, it's going to deal with sin. And if the word is in you, it's going to work its way out of you, right? And therein, you know, your, your words, your meditations become acceptable unto the Lord. In Colossians 3.16, it says that the, the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Mm -hmm. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, it's coming out of you, and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Uh, there's this illustration that, that Dan Renault used to always give, which I'm sure he got from Sam, who got from someone else. Uh, but he'd always give us this illustration of uh, a lemon. And say, you know, if you squeeze a lemon... What's going to come out of it? What? Lemon juice, yeah, but, but what if it's rotten? Whatever's going to come out of you is what's inside of you. And so when the things of this world are pressuring you, do, do, does, you know, do, does Jesus come out of you? You know, when, when the world squeezes you, Jesus, you know? Oh, that's what's inside of me, you know? But, but whatever's in you, that's what's going to come out of you. Man, let that be God's word. Let that be the, the meditation of our heart. Let that be the thing that's on our lips, right? In closing, I want to tell you a story about three wise men. You know, we, we talked about earlier how we desire to be wise. And so in Matthew chapter 2, we see the example, the, the story of three wise men. Are you guys familiar with this? You guys usually you probably hear it around Christmas time. <laughs> So the example of these three wise men is that they begin their journey by considering God's glory revealed in the heavens, right? You know, they're, they're just looking up at the sky, and a special messenger is sent from God, a star, right? And this star leads these men from the east. And by verse 4 of Matthew chapter 2, we find the, these three wise men in Jerusalem with Herod, consulting God's words, right? It, it, all the scribes are there trying to figure out where this king is going to be born. And they're consulting God's word and they find that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And so the, these men, the, the, they leave the, leave the presence of, of Herod and they went to Bethlehem and there found and worshipped their personal savior. There they, they found and they worshipped their, their personal savior. This weekend, we got to consider God's glory revealed in creation, right? We got to consider God's glory revealed in Scripture. And the question now is, will you allow it to be revealed in you? Hmm. Will you allow it to be revealed in you? Is this going to fall out to you worshiping your Creator, your God, and knowing Him personally? Mm -hmm. For these wise men, for these wise men, it started with, with the glory of God being revealed from creation, and it led them to his word. And from there, it led them to, to the God-man, 
to Jesus Christ, right? Man, will you allow that same work to be revealed in you? And so uh, I'm going to close us in prayer. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we, we don't want to, again, go through the motions of retreat, uh, get in the Word of God, and then go back just keep living life the, the way that we've been living life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Word of God, it's not just sufficient, it's abundant. It's able to, to completely transform mm -hmm. the whole of you. It's able to, to, to make you wise beyond your years. It's able to, to, to give you joy, to enlighten your eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Man, this is a powerful Word. And it says that it's more valuable than anything that you could ever imagine. Y'all, you can't imagine having thousands of gold and silver. That's like beyond comprehension for most of us, right? But his word is far above all of that. And if we allow it to, it's going to work its way into our lives, into our hearts, and then the, the natural byproduct is it comes out of us, right? And, and through that, God is glorified. Through mm -hmm. that, he finds it acceptable, right? Mm -hmm. He finds that the meditation of our heart the words of our mouth acceptable. So man, it starts with getting this word inside of you. And so I pray today, uh, Lord, that you'd bless these people, uh, that they would see the value of your word, that you'd allow it to completely transform them, that, that you'd be glorified through it. Uh, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.